the St. Louis Cardinals, and baseball's first lady. That story next on City Corner. I'm Steve Potter and welcome to City Corner. Baseball's first lady is a story of the first woman to own a major baseball team in the United States. It's a fascinating story and we welcome the author Joan Thomas. Hi Joan, welcome to City Corner. Good morning, I'm honored to be here. It's great to have you. Uh, I never claimed to be an expert on baseball or baseball trivia, but this was a story that I had never heard. Actually, that's one of the reasons I wrote the book. When I discovered that a woman once owned the St. Louis Cardinals and no one seemed to know it. I thought this, this is a story that needs to be told. And you just sort of uh, accidentally tumbled onto that information, didn't you? Well, when I was researching made the, all the old major league ballparks in the city of St. Louis. And uh, during that time, I, that's when I stumbled, I didn't really stumble on it, I began to realize it. It was just one of those things that's known but it seems like mostly just a few baseball aficionados were aware of it. And at first I didn't realize she was the first, and then I discovered she was the first woman ever to own a major league club. This was back in 1911 when she inherited the club. And you have to remember women in this country didn't have the right to vote. Right. And they had no part of any major league club. This was just something that was unknown, unheard of. In fact, when she inherited the club, there was some question as to whether or not it was even legal for her to inherit the club. But the, uh, the other owners said, well, you know, there's no reason that she couldn't inherit the club, but I'm sure they're gonna, she's going to want to sell. You know, and everyone yeah, just... Why would a woman yeah. want a club, right? <laughs> but she had no intention well, of Well, her name was Helen. She was not from here originally. Who was Helen? Helene, uh, Helene. actually it's Helene. Uh, her name was Helene Hathaway Robeson Britton when she inherited the club. She was married at the time. Uh, she was 32 years old and she had two small children. And her father uh, originally owned the club that became the St. Louis Cardinals. Uh, she grew up around baseball when she was a, a young girl. Um, her father owned a Cleveland club. They were from Cleveland, Ohio. And uh, it was a National League club called the Spiders. And that's another thing that a lot of people are unaware of. And her father owned that club and in 1899 he got the opportunity to purchase the St. Louis club, um, National League club, which at the time was called the Browns. Mm -hmm. So he purchased that club, and then when he died in 1908, uh, his brother Stanley already owned the club. He had already bought the club from him. Stanley was a bachelor and didn't have any children of his own. He was very close to Helene's family. And so um, he, uh, when he died uh, in 1911, everyone was shocked to learn that he left all of his baseball enterprise, the ballpark and the club, to his niece Helene and her mother Sarah. Hmm. She got 75%, her mother got 25%. And um, everyone was surprised to learn that she had every intention of, of taking over the club as an owner. And she did, and she was an active owner uh, all the way up until 1917. Uh, do you know, did people give her a hard time? Do you have any insight on that? Uh, I've read a lot of the news. It's easy to kind of go through. It's not easy, I shouldn't say that, but I, I scanned all the old newspaper reports at the time. And from what I could learn, it was more of a novelty. And everyone kind of was surprised that she would take over the club, but then they thought, well, she'll sell. And then when she made it clear the club is not for sale, they assumed, well, she'll be like a figurehead, like the Queen of England. <laughs> and, uh, but that wasn't the case. She even attended all the, um, the owners' meetings. 
Uh, and there's actually a picture in my book of her at an owner's meeting. But do we know how she was received? I mean, did, did the boys club, you know, give her a hard time? Or? I don't, I, I think they were, they all knew her father and her uncle. So I'm sure they were gentlemanly toward her, but uh -huh. uh, I'm sure they weren't extremely happy about her being there. There were implications in the newspapers that you know, they would suggest that she was, she was a woman and she would change her mind about things, you know. And there were, the sports writers just had a lot of fun with it. They poked fun at the notion of a woman owning a baseball team. In fact, there was one big cartoon in the St. Louis Post-Dispatch that said, uh, when the woman rule, the women. And they had all sorts of implications that now it was going to have to be a more ladylike game. <laughs> and they even said, now the next thing you know, we're going to have a female umpire. <laughs> <laughs> well, you think about this. This was a century ago. We still have no female umpires right. in Major League Baseball. And still very few women owners since then. There have been a total of six, I think I counted that the other day, uh, women who are major majority stockholders in Major League Baseball clubs. Right. When well, you think country. about that in the scheme of things, so that's pretty small. That's fairly small. Right. Right, right. We have uh, three pictures from the book of Helene we want to take a look at. And tell me a little bit about her. She came from a very privileged background, didn't she? Yes, her father uh, owned a street railway company in Cleveland. And of course, he uh, also owned uh, uh, that baseball club. So she grew up around baseball. And uh, their family bought 20 acres of prime property along Lake Erie in a place that was called Glenville on the Lake. And there was this big mansion there. At first it was their summer home, and then it became the Robeson family's main home. Her father's name was Frank de Haas Robeson. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's pretty much where she grew up. And it, the, uh, the mansion she grew up in, you could view Lake Erie from three sides of, of the house. So it was prime property then. Today that area of Cleveland is called Bratnell. And uh, it still is an, uh, a charming community. Yeah. So she grew up in society, they're right. part of what they called the, was it the Blue Book? Yeah, the, her family's name was listed in the Cleveland Blue Book. Uh, she was refined, she loved uh, music and dancing, and she loved the theater. She knew all the latest dance steps, and she was, always wore the latest fashions, but she also loved her father and her uncle's pastime. She loved to play billiards. Well, well women, that's not very ladylike, is no, it? No, it wasn't expected. <laughs> you know, women of her class weren't expected to play a game like billiards. They had a billiards table in their home, and she really enjoyed that, and she also loved baseball. And she learned to keep score at an early age. So her father uh, got into baseball in the Cleveland area originally. Right. He was pretty successful at it, was he not? The Cleveland Spiders uh, were a good team. In fact, they won the equivalent of what we think of as the World Series today. It was called the Temple Cup. And um, he finally um, got fed up with the Cleveland fans because he didn't think they supported his club like they thought they sh he thought they should. So he had this opportunity to buy the St. Louis Club. Do you know how that happened? Uh, yeah, the, the original owner of the the St. Louis Browns uh, was bankrupt. And so Frank Robeson had this opportunity to buy the St. Louis Browns. He bought them for $40,000, <laughs> if you think about it. And uh, within about a year after he bought the club, they started to call, well, at first, he wanted to start a whole new era, first of all. Uh, their, the trim on their uniforms was brown. Uh, so he got new uniforms uh, that had red trim, and he called them the Perfectos. The which Perfectos. That was a, like a catchy turn-of-the-century name. The, the Brooklyn Dodgers at that time were called the Superbas. Oh. So, <laughs> so that's the way people viewed things. But within about a year of his um, um, taking over the St. Louis Club, they started calling them the Cardinals. It had nothing to do with the bird. Oh, really? Right. The bird on the bat logo didn't come into being, I think, until 1922. Was it the state bird at that time? You know, I don't know. Huh. But uh, the reason they called them the Cardinals was the color of the uniforms. We think of the car a cardinal as a Catholic prelate or a bird. Right. But in those days, cardinal was considered a shade of red. Huh. And uh, that's the color of the, the trim on their uniform. 
And this is just family legend. Nobody knows for sure what got him to start calling him the Cardinals, but a sports writer for an old, uh, now non-existent newspaper, I think it was the St. Louis Republic, called Willie McHale, was the sports writer, overheard a woman in the stand saying, remarking at the new uniform, saying, what a lovely shade of cardinal. Well, that supposedly, that's the story, what got the uh, team started calling themselves the Cardinals. Helene Britton's descendants believe it was her that said that. And it's very possible. It, it would be right in character for her to say such a thing. It's, it's working out, they should keep it. <laughs> <laughs> so, and so they were called the Cardinals, but like I say, the bird on the bat didn't come into being until 1922. So you said her dad paid, what, $40,000 for it? 40000 for the club. I don't know what that would translate into today's dollars, but certainly, <laughs> Baseball wasn't a big money game then like it is today. Not like it is today. I mean, I don't know what the players could have made back then. That didn't make them rich then, I know. Well, no, they didn't make a lot of money. You know, the better players did well, you know, but not compared to the way it is today. So her uh, father passes away, yep. and the ownership goes to his brother. Well, actually, his brother Stanley purchased the club Purchase. from him. Uh, a couple of years before he died because uh, he was uh, having some financial problems. Her father, Frank, was kind of a gregarious, big-time spender, and uh, apparently he kind of frittered away his fortune. So his brother took over. His brother was a little more better businessman. So uh, then uh, uh, Stanley, or Frank, died in 1908, and then Stanley, the brother, or Helene's uncle died in March 24th of 1911. Hmm. We're talking mm -hmm. about uh, Helene Britton, baseball's first lady. Joan Thomas is the author, and we'll be back after this. United States Armed Forces, the USO, is home. The USO depends on the generosity of the American people, people just like you. To find out how you can help, visit us at USO.org. The USO, until everyone comes home. Did you vote in the last election? I know I would have. I'd want my voice to be heard. You see, the only way your ideas can count is for our elected officials to hear from you. My dad says it's easy. Just learn about the process and vote. So you have all this power to really make a difference. And you didn't take time to vote? Am I missing something? Learn how to make your ideas count by logging on to www.representativedemocracy.org. City Corner. We're talking about the book Baseball's First Lady. 
by Joan Thomas, which tells the story of the first woman to own a major league baseball team. And it was the St. Louis Cardinals. That's right. Uh, Joan, could you tell me a little bit about your background as a writer? I know you've done a few other books about baseball. Um, yes, I uh, wrote a book that was published in 2004 called St. Louis's Big League Ballparks. And it was about the former major league ballparks in the city of St. Louis. There's more than people realize. You know, so, uh, well, in fact... Well, talk a little bit about that. Well, in fact, one of the, the parks that a lot of people are unaware of is where the Cardinals played when Helene Britton owned the club. It was uh, where Beaumont High School is located today, across from, um, uh, what's the name of the park? Fairgrounds Park uh -huh. at um, Vandeventer and Natural Bridge. And th that baseball club uh, had that park built, uh, I think they moved in there in 1893, and they played there all the way up until 1920. So uh, if you're going down uh, Natural Bridge and go by Beaumont and High School, you'll realize that's where the Cardinals played all those years. Very few people are aware of that. Hmm. And yeah. it's so interesting, Helene owned this team, this is something you brought up in the first half of the show. Mm -hmm. Uh, she owned this team at a time before women had the right to vote. That's right. It was a time when if a woman wanted to go to see a baseball game, she wouldn't have gone without a male escort either. That's right, yeah. They weren't allowed to go without a male escort. And so she even uh, instituted a ladies' day while she was an owner. She wanted to uh, entice more women to come to the ballpark. And uh, so they had things like ladies' day. In fact, one of the interviews, uh, she was interviewed several times by a woman named Marguerite Martin, who was notable in her own right. She was a, a, a reporter for the uh, St. Louis Post-Dispatch, and in those days, very few women got bylines in a major newspaper, unless it was in the society pages. But um, when she was interviewed by Marguerite Martin, uh, Marguerite Martin brings, a, brings out a lot of her personality. And um, I think she wanted, to, uh, wanted, wanted baseball to be a family event, so that if women came, they would bring their children along. It's funny now to think mm -hmm. that it wasn't at one time. That's <laughs> that, right. It? That's right. It really wasn't. Huh. And um, uh, women could get in free. The, her ladies' day was women could be admitted free with a male escort. So I've heard stories huh. where w women that didn't, didn't have a male escort, would go down to the park and find some guy to take him in. <laughs> <laughs> well, those getting in free days are yeah. over, aren't they? Yeah, yeah. Joan, talk a little bit about how, how you sort of stumbled on this, uh, stumbled on the idea to do this book, and it has to do with Helene's ancestors, her family, too. You make, you make contact with them. Right. What happened, I, I was always interested in her once I learned about her, and I'd done some research, but there were a lot of pieces missing. I didn't quite understand, and I didn't have enough information. So I did write uh, a short biography for the Society for American Baseball Research. I'm a member of that organization, and they have a biography website. So I wrote a biography that's on their website. I had no idea who her descendants were or where they lived. I had no idea. I, and I was kind of new to research back then, so I wasn't sure how to find it out. Well, her great-granddaughter, who lived in Texas, still lives in Texas, found that article or that biography on the Internet. So the Internet has been a big boom. And uh, she contacted me through Sabre because there were things that I had in that biography that she didn't know. I don't, she never did say what about her great grandmother. And uh, I think she really would, was hoping that I would do a book. So she convinced her mother to come down to St. Louis to meet me. Her mother lives in Illinois. And her mother, of course, is Helene's granddaughter. And I spent a day with the two of them and got to know them quite well. Just, it's funny how you can get to know someone in such a short period mm -hmm. of time. But uh, what struck me about both her mother and her her name is Crystal, the, the great-granddaughter, is that they both seem very independent and very ladylike, but they all both had their own interest. In fact, Crystal has absolutely no interest in baseball, and her mother is a big sports fan. So, I mean, they, they all go their separate ways. Um, I came into contact then uh, with... 
uh, Crystal's sister, Candace. It turns out Candace is a big sports fan and, believe it or not, a Cubs fan. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, like I say, they all, they're independent individuals, and they put me in contact with uh, their mother's brother, uh, who had a lot of the family archives, uh, Jeffrey Britton. And he lived in San Diego, and he's the one that provided me with a lot of the family archives. I see. I know you had, uh, they came down, as you said, you had uh, went out to lunch with them. And yes. Also, you went out to lunch with an old friend of mine, Paula Homan, who runs the Cardinals Museum right. here. Was Paula interested in this story? Oh, yes, she was. Paula was very interested because, because of her operating the museum. And, uh, she, in fact, she was going to send some information. You know, she exchanged um, addresses uh, with Char, who is uh, Crystal's mother. Yeah, pa Paula was very much interested in it. Okay, we're talking about Helene Britton, who at one time owned the St. Louis Cardinals. I think it was for about six years. Yep. She was born Helene Hathaway. They are from Cleveland. Hathaway Robeson. Hathaway was her mother's oh, name. Oh, I see. Yeah, her name <laughs> It's a long name. It's, it's a long name to say Helene Hathaway Robeson. And then when she got married, her name was Britton. Well, you talked about her growing up in a very affluent uh, area of Cleveland, mm -hmm. and her father owned a, owned a baseball team there. Mm -hmm. We have some images of, uh, I think, the original home that was there, and then I think a home that replaced it. So In Cleveland, yes. Yeah, tell us what we're looking at. That's uh, a, a long lake Erie. And when the Robesons bought it, uh, it's on almost 20 acres of property. And you can actually view Lake Erie from three sides of the house. The house no longer is there, by the way. Mm -hmm. But uh, that part of Cleveland at the time was called Bratnell on the, or yeah, Bratnell on the lake. Glenville on the lake, I'm sorry. It's now known as Bratnell. And um, they planted, when they bought the property, they planted California privet hedges along, around, and they, then they called it Villa Hedges. Let's look at the next shot. Is this the same home? It's the same home. I think it's just a different view. Mm -hmm. Now this is uh, uh, Principia School. This is where Helene's children attended school when she lived here. She moved her family to St. Louis in 1912. She's a Christian, she was a Christian scientist, uh -huh. and Principia was founded by a group of Christian uh, science parents. So that's where her two children attended school while she lived here. Hmm. I just learned recently that that building was at Page and Belt. Is that right? Yeah, and that's actually a picture postcard of that So school. that six years that she ran the Cardinals, was mm -hmm. she a full-time St. Louisan? Yes, she moved to St. Louis. Actually, she moved to St. Louis in 1912. Now, she, uh, her father and her uncle never did have Cle uh, St. Louis residences. They always maintained their Cleveland homes. But she wanted to oversee her family and her, her business. Uh, she was a full-time owner. She went to work every day. In fact, in one of her interviews, she said that Saturday was the day to spend with her children, hmm. you know. So... Um, that was one thing she did that her, neither her father or her uncle do. She lived here on Lindell Avenue. Uh -huh. You mm -hmm. mentioned her family. We have three shots, I think, or four shots of mm -hmm. uh, the family. And if you could talk a little about that. She had two children, I believe. Right. She had two children. That's the only family portrait I have. That's her husband, Skyler, and her little daughter, Marie, and her son, Frank, who is named after her father. That, that picture was taken around 1915. I think it's a beautiful shot. It is. Yeah, and th this is Helene when she was a young girl. She's on the far left. That's her older sister Marie standing and her younger sister Hortense. Now Hortense and Marie both passed away before uh, their uh, father, or before Helene inherited the club. So she hmm. was the sole surviving child of the Robesons. I say otherwise it might have been owned by three women. It may have, yeah. it may have, but I think she was the one that was most interested in baseball. Now this is a photograph that was taken much later in Helene's life. She aged quite beautifully. That's her with her three grandsons. The little guy sitting on her lap is Jeffrey Britton. And he's the one that uh, provided me with all the uh, family archives. The two are standing are Donald and Douglas. She also had a granddaughter, Charlotte, who's not, she was an infant when this photograph was taken. This was probably taken around 1948. Now this is, was taken in Atlantic City. This is long after she owned the club. And there she is with her grown children, uh, Marie and Frank. 
at Atlantic City. I love these family photos. They're really done well. And mm -hmm. coming from an affluent family, you're lucky to have those because they could afford those, those uh, ex expensive photographs, yeah, yeah. which is nice to have now. Right. Well, what, did, the, did the World's Fair uh, of 1904 in St. Louis do much? Uh, I, th I think you mentioned that in your book, that that had a positive effect on baseball. Oh, sure, because all these people were pouring into the city to go to the base and go to the World's Fair so of course they'd go to the baseball games yeah mm -hmm. and how successful was the St. Louis Cardinals during the six years that Helene managed them she said she you said she was very active and involved right how would you sum up her tenure well actually she, compared to her father and her uncle the the Cardinals didn't do all that well when her father and her uncle owned the club uh, the American League came into existence early in the 20th century so he lost a lot of his better players to the American League and to the new American League Browns. And um, then uh, they, he, he lost uh, players uh, for various reasons. So they never, they really didn't have that good of a club. Uh, but when Hen Helene took over the club, uh, it, they started to show promise. In fact, they ended up playing over 500 ball the first year that she owned the club. Mm. So she gave her uh, manager, Roger Bresnahan, a lucrative contract, $10,000 a year, Ooh. and 10% uh, <laughs> of the profits. Huh. It was a five-year contract. So that, was a, that would be considered really a good contract back in those days. Yeah. But then she became disenchanted with him when they slipped back in the standing the, the next year, and she fired him. And she was also, we just have a few seconds left, she was involved in a few lawsuits. Yes, there were several lawsuits having to do with the administration of her uncle's estate. Yeah. And she got her way in both of those Joan, lawsuits. Joan, uh, just briefly then, what's mm -hmm. the one thing you admire most about Helene Britton? I admire the fact that she, she was given an opportunity uh, and she took advantage of that opportunity. She even t said that's all any woman needs is the opportunity. She could have just gone ahead and sold the club and used the money uh, for her own good, but she loved baseball. She saw no reason why she couldn't be an owner, even though uh, many people just assumed that uh, she couldn't possibly do such a thing. So I, I did admire her. And she went through a, a difficult divorce, and she kept, kept her head held high through everything. Mm. Well, there's a lot more in the book, uh, Baseball's First Lady, and you don't have to be a baseball fan to find it enjoyable. But, of course, if you live in St. Louis, you probably are. So, <laughs> Joan Thomas, thank you so much for joining us today, and I hope people will check your book out. We'll have contact information how they can get the book. So, okay. nice meeting you. Thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. My pleasure. I'm Steve Potter. That's all the time we have for City Corner today. We'll see you next time. Bye.